Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today in the Citadel Museum in Quebec City, Quebec. It's that Citadel. And we're taking a look at a really interesting rifle that they have on display here. Now this is actually a reproduction of the rifle. It's actually quite unusual for a museum to have created a reproduction like this and it's very cool and that it gives us a chance to uh, take a close up look at this despite the fact that the real one is in permanent display in the museum. So. Uh, this rifle is named Rosalie, uh, the same as the French bayonet, and specifically deliberately so. And it was carved extensively by Henri Lecor, who was a uh, actually an ex-legionnaire, moved to Canada uh, before World War I, and then in 1915 enlisted in the Canadian Army to fight in the First World War. So I'm going to go through the whole story of this rifle, but I'm going to do it while we take a look up close at the, the reproduced carvings on the gun, because that's what's cool about it. So Le Carre's story here begins uh, in 1915 when he enlists in the army, uh, ships off to training and is issued a Ross rifle. And he thinks this is quite a beautiful rifle. He's really quite taken with it. And he decides to name it. And he names it Josephine and he carves its name in the stock. And uh, his squad mates think this is pretty cool. And so no less than 11 of them uh, have him carve girlfriend's names in their rifles as well. Uh, this comes to the attention of the officers uh, of the unit. Yeah, the, the company commander doesn't think it's that big a deal. The sergeant major does think it's a big deal and uh, throws him in front of, uh, <laughs> says something to the effect of, well, you, you might not get shot for this, but you'll probably get five years in the brig. Uh, he ends up in front of a colonel uh, and is basically just let off with a slap on the wrist. Uh, he starts talking about his his uh, service in the French Foreign Legion and comes up with this excuse that, well, in the, in the Legion, we, we did this and it was a sign of respect to the rifle. And so I didn't realize, you know, I was doing anything wrong. And the Colonel basically says, all right, well, you were, don't do it again, get out of here. So uh, that's kind of the end of this until we fast forward a year or so. Uh, Le Car ends up in France. Uh, he is, by the way, French originally emigrated to Canada. Um, Le Car ends up in France uh, in combat, and his first major combat is the Battle of the Somme, so quite the introduction to the war. And it's at that point that he decides um, that he, he really, really likes this SMLE that he's been issued uh, over there, and he wants to do the same sort of thing for it, but maybe more and better. And so he, he picks the name Rosalie, uh, named specifically after the nickname for the French bayonet, uh, based on the uh, the folk song, sort of uh, publicity propaganda song about Rosalie. And he starts on the back here, he carves the rifle's name and he carves a star in it. And the star is in memory of uh, what's called, uh, the, in French it's called his war godmother, um, basically a pen pal. It was a way for soldiers just to have a little bit of human contact uh, writing back and forth uh, with, with folks on the, the home front. So anyway, her name is Stella star, hence he adds a star to the back of the rifle. And then he starts plotting out the rest of the engraving that he's going to do. So this was all done with a pocket knife um, and, and it escalated over the course of the war. He would be in combat uh, until 1918, until at least the summer of 1918. And as he was in battles, uh, he added various names to the rifle. So it's kind of a journal of everywhere that he and his unit, by the way, uh, the 22nd uh, Canadian Regiment, which is the unit that runs the, or is stationed based uh, at the Citadel. So this come, this is important. This comes back uh, of relevance in our story. At any rate, he continues to engrave uh, battles and place names onto the rifle, uh, originally thinking, well, it's not that big a deal. And, and eventually, uh, later in the war, he's doing it really out of, partially out of spite to officialdom. Uh, morale as one understands in World War I, takes a, a bit of a turn down uh, as the war progresses. And so he cares less and less about whether he's going to get caught doing this. Uh, although it is interesting to note, he does not carve the right side of the rifle at all, except for just a little bit of, of uh, a, a little bit of decoration on the grip. And this is so that on parade, uh, he can hold the decorated left side up hidden against his leg, display the, the regular, uh, original unmolested side of the rifle and hopefully not get in trouble. Well, he does actually get caught twice um, 
you know, twice the quartermaster or the sergeant or, or another officer finds this carved rifle. This is, of course, completely prohibited uh, by general military discipline. You, you cannot do this. Uh, this is defacing government property, the king's property in this case. And he is uh, sent to the brig. The rifle is sent out for destruction. And twice he manages to get it back. Uh, the one time, as best I can tell, he, uh, he, he gets out of his own cell and then finds where they're storing rifles that are going to be destroyed or, or sent back for refurbishing and impersonates an MP and manages to get it back. Uh, the second time, some friends help him get it back. They, they carve up a fake rifle the second time and swap it. So it looks like they're sending out Rosalie to be destroyed, but it's actually just a, a quick fake. Uh, ultimately, uh, in 1918, he is seriously wounded in combat. Uh, you know, goes out on the attack, uh, loses consciousness, and wakes up a day and a half later uh, in Dieppe in a military hospital. And the rifle's long gone. And that's, that's all he knows of it until uh, 1956. Well, what happens in the meantime is this rifle is found on the battlefield and uh, collected up along with all of the other rifles that have been uh, abandoned on the field or lost on the field. This is a pretty typical thing. You, you know, the armies need, need arms. And so after a battle, whenever possible, they'll collect up damaged rifles, send them back to be refurbished and then reissued. Well, this one gets back to the Enfield factory in England and someone sees it at Enfield and says, you know what, this, this is a pretty cool piece of, of field art. Rather than th you know, destroy this stock, put a new stock on and send it back uh, into combat, presumably at this point we're getting towards the end of the war, um, they decide to keep it. And uh, one of the, the, the commandant or the, the general or the director of the Enfield factory finds it, thinks it's pretty cool, uh, has it in his office for a while. And come World War II, a Canadian officer happens to notice it uh, at the Enfield factory and uh, says, you know what, this, this came from the 22nd uh, Canadian Regiment and it'd be really cool to have it back. And so they end up sending it back to Canada uh, where it's received at the Citadel by the 22nd. And if a few years later in 1950, uh, they set up the museum here at the Citadel and this is one of the the artifacts that originally goes into the museum on display because of its connection to the 22nd. Now at this point, they don't know where it came from. I mean, they know it was found and, and saved by Enfield, but they don't know any of the backstory to it. And it's not until 1956 that uh, part of the museum collection is on display at a little town in Quebec. And the original artist, Henri Lecour, happens to visit this exhibition and someone mentions, hey, you know, there's this carved up rifle you know, in the back on that other, on that other display rack back there. And uh, the more they talk about it, the more it sounds like his rifle, which he, as, as one might expect, he doesn't really believe this could possibly be his rifle. His rifle was lost and destroyed, you know, 30 years ago on, in, in France. But he goes to take a look at it. And uh, lo and behold, when he sees this thing, it's basically like a bolt of lightning out of the past. Like, wow, this is actually my rifle. And you can imagine the reaction when he tells the, you know, the, the corporal who's uh, standing by the exhibit, hey, that's my rifle. Well, <laughs> whatever. No, it's not. You know, um, this was carved up by, you know, some veteran after the war. Because if you did this actually in combat, well, you'd get thrown in jail for it. And uh, LaCour basically says, well, yeah, you know, I actually paid for that rifle because they charged me its value because I destroyed it in the military's eyes. Um, and ultimately, he is able to prove his case by, uh, by reciting back the rifle's serial number without having seen it. As a proper military veteran, he has uh, memorized his rifle's serial number. And when he spits that back out at them, that, that starts to change the situation. And they, they recognize, like, maybe this guy's actually telling the truth. And uh, of course, the story develops a bit. He is, in fact, telling the truth. This is his rifle, and, and it ends up going back into uh, the Citadel Museum with its complete backstory. So it's really a unique firearm in that, uh, in, in having this level of decoration on it, which is the sort of thing that simply doesn't happen in a professional army. Uh, you get thrown in the brig for doing this, like Le Cor actually was. Um, but one, I suppose once the rifle uh, gets out of 
out of field service, people recognize like, oh, wow, that's actually really cool. It's, it's interesting, it's impressive, and it's a, a very cool piece of history. So uh, the rifle survived, and then we have this very cool story of it being uh, reunited with its original owner. At any rate, uh, if you would like to see the real one in person, it is permanently on display up in the Citadel. So uh, head on up to Quebec City, check it out. There's a bunch of other interesting stuff in the museum up here. Thanks for watching.